boxes um, on the way out. So we're going through the book of Exodus, uh, the story of Exodus. And last week, Moses was born, and his mother, uh, after hiding him for a while, she um, put him in the Nile River, and uh, she, the baby boy uh, Moses uh, was rescued by the Pharaoh's daughter. And uh, the, the, the scripture says, when the child uh, grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. He became the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. That's what his name means, drawn out, to draw out, to draw out. And Moses would later draw people out of Egypt. And so this uh, series that we're doing is about uh, not just the historical story of Israel, but it's about the story of our life as well, as God draws us out of Egypt, whatever Egypt is in your life, might be worth thinking about during this series. Um, what are the things that hold you down? What are the things that hold you back? And sometimes they're external forces that need to be addressed, confronted. Um, there are people or, 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 or systems or whatever that need to be addressed, but also it's internal. There are things within us that hold us back. And we should also be careful not to trick ourselves into always thinking it's external, right? Where we're always blaming. Here's the reason I'm not getting anywhere in life. It's because of them. It's because of them. And sometimes we have to look at we are our own oppressors. And I think that will um, kind of bear out as we go through this. So let's continue the story. We'll pick it up, uh, Exodus 2, verse 11. One day... After Moses had grown up, so he's a baby, he became the, the, uh, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he went out to where his own people were, and he watched them at their hard labor. Um, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Now, um, I really got thinking a lot about Moses this week. And I, there were a lot of things I was trying to piece together, you know, like how much time was Moses, um, at what age was he transferred uh, to Pharaoh's daughter? We don't know. Uh, presumably pretty young, but we, we aren't sure. Maybe three years old. Um, maybe she, the, the, the mother came back and forth to, to nurse him or to help care for him. But... Somewhat early on, he grew up in Pharaoh's household, so he knew himself as an, uh, an Egyptian. And as I was digging into this, this story um, really started to, uh, to strike me. Let me read the next verse, and then we'll come back. Verse 12 says, uh, glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and he thought, what I have, what I have done must become known. Now, this is the first kind of uh, public action of Moses. He's obviously now um, a man, uh, and uh, this is his first, um, you know, this is it, anything that we know of Moses acting in, in sort of public. And the first thing that Moses does is, as we see, he kills a man. Now, talk about getting off to a rough start in life. You, you know, and there's a lot of things that you could say about this. You know, you could talk about the fact that Moses, um, you know, we all, we all make mistakes and we're all, as we talk about, beautifully broken and this is a part of his brokenness and certainly that's part of his story. But I was, I was digging into this and, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to understand what was Moses doing on this day he went out for a walk? And... Um, 
I found a Hebrew scholar who was talking about this, explaining it in Hebrew. As we know, the Bible was not written in English. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And this is how he explained it. Back to verse 11. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his brothers were. That's how it is. Or his kin. The Hebrew is kin. So his own people, it's translated there, I think. But the real word is kin. Now, the question is, who did he think were his kin at the time? The Egyptians. And so probably in reality, unless, unless somebody told him, hey, you're actually you know, not Egyptian, um, and we, we don't exactly know, but this guy's saying no. He was just going out to see, his, to see people, and he saw something. And what he saw disturbed him. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. So the way it's translated there, because we know, reading the story earlier, we know that he's Hebrew, but this guy says, no, no, no. He saw a, a, one man of his own brothers beating another. And he, then he says, he looked this way and that. He glanced, and this is kind of good. Because the way it's written in your English Bible often says, it's like he was looking around to see if he's gonna get busted looking around, am I gonna get busted and then I'm gonna kill this guy? He says, no, 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 this is not how you read it. Here's how you read it. Now, again, I don't know, any, anybody read Hebrew here? Uh, maybe some of you do, I mean, I know we have different folks that are Jewish, so. Um, he said, Moses saw this happen. This guy, his brother, his fellow brother, Egyptian, beating this guy as a slave. And he looked around for a man. So the first way you'd interpret it is he was looking for somebody because he's going to do something. But he was, he was looking for, is anybody, is there a man in the house? Is there anybody that's going to do anything about this? This, my friends, was one of the defining moments of Moses' life. And you'll have them too. You'll be walking along, going for a walk, checking on people. How are you doing? Maybe you're going to work. Maybe you're checking on your kids or your family, and you're going to see something. You're going to experience something, and it's not going to sit right with you. And you're going to turn, and you're going to look this way and that way. Is there somebody that's going to do something about this? It's going to get you down here. It's going to feel wrong in here. But you're going to look around to see who's going to, who's going to fix it, who's going to do something about it. Moses couldn't find anybody. You ever been in that situation where you're just looking around and think, man, somebody needs to say something. Somebody needs to stand up. Somebody needs to do something. You know what Moses was doing? He was discovering who God had made him to be. You're supposed to do something about this. You're supposed to stand up. Look around all you want. There's no one that's going to do it except you. Glancing around, looking for somebody. Um, your passion in life is the thing that you can't help but do. And you should pay attention to that. It's the thing you can't help but do. Like for my sister, it's cross-stitching. People actually do that. I mean, she goes to conventions where they do that. My sister, as a cross-stitcher, has probably 10 times more followers on YouTube than I do as a pastor. That's the truth. She does. She's got her own YouTube channel. But it's called cross-stitching. People waste, I mean, they spend their time <laughs> doing that. Does that make sense? I mean, I mean, it doesn't make sense, but they act, and, then, and they go and they spend money to do it. How many know you have a passion? You have something that you lean to, and you can't help it. You can't help it what you love. You love it. It's weird. You're weird. 
you know, but you need to know that. You, you, you're different. You're unique. God made you that way. There's something about you. And what Moses was doing is he was starting to discover, wait a minute. God, God made me different. And, and this part of the story is so important because... <clears throat> We, we all know the rest of the story. You know, Moses, he's the leader. He's the one that pulls him out. But this is the part, this is the key thing where he discovers it. I can't stand for that. I can't just sit here and let that happen. You ever been there? I can't sit here anymore. I got to get involved. I have to do something. This is, this is unjust. This guy can just take his power and just beat this guy down, just beat him down. <clears throat> I got to get involved. Who's going to stand up? Moses found out he had a passion. You have passions too. There are things you can't help but do. You're you're, going to do them no matter what. You're going to do them. I mean, I I was thinking about this. I was thinking back to like when I was in high school. I mean, go, go figure. I was in high school. I'd sit in, in study hall and read the Bible and theology books. And you think, well, you must have had, like your pastor must have been challenging you or your parents were mandating or you, did you go to a Christian school? No, no, no. My football coach used to make fun of me. He's like, Kramer, are there any plays in that thing? <clears throat> he literally said that to me. I said, well, there's a lot of plays, coach. Lots of plays. Why, why? Some young kid had this passion to read. I was thinking about, you know, Charlie, she's just turned four now, and like she has passion. Like, as soon as she gets up, I mean, she must be dressed beautifully. <laughs> beautifully. And there must be glitter, and there must be sparkles, and like, I didn't teach her any of that stuff. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Anybody seen this stuff? They, it, it's on the inside of you. And God puts stuff on the inside of each and every one of us. And if we're ready, if we're ready, some of you, I mean, it's, it's cars. It's like <clears throat> some of you, you just have to have a wrench in your hand. I mean, if something isn't broke, <clears throat> you'll break it so you can fix it. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? That's how some of you are. It's just what God gave you. And uh, I, I remember, like, I kind of want to be that guy. But I had to, a while ago, I had to give up and say, I'm not that guy. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, you are that person. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. She got involved, right? Way to get involved. And I, I you know, I, I see these guys, you know, you know what it's like. You see all these shows and all the men, like they got, they got cool garages and they got wrenches. And I thought, well, I got to be a man. I got to get a wrench, you know. My dad, I had a lot of wrenches. And <clears throat> the other day, I was trying to change a battery, and it took me like two and a half days to try to change a battery, and I realized I'm not a man, or, or I'm, not a, I'm not a mechanic, that's for sure. <clears throat> but what you have to realize is, you know, God gave you something. And then with that, you're going you're gonna to have a moment you're going to see something like what Moses saw that day, and it's going to define you if you say yes to the moment. Now, Moses didn't, later on, he sees two two, uh, Hebrews fighting each other, and then he starts to chastise the one who's abusing the other, and and, uh, he ends up having to flee because he learns that Pharaoh's heard about the day before and he takes off into the wilderness. And when he goes off into the wilderness, <clears throat> he's leaving a lot behind. So just, anybody ever seen the pyramids? All right, Egypt, all right? Um, this was not, this was, uh, I don't wanna say this. These were highly sophisticated, intelligent people Go try to build a pyramid next weekend or in the next 30 years of your life. See if you can accomplish it. Incredibly sophisticated, intelligent people. And what he's leaving behind 
is unbelievable. And not only is he leaving it behind like, oh, he lived in a nice middle-class Egyptian neighborhood. No. He's in the palace. He is the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So when he takes off in the wilderness, it's kissing goodbye to everything. But when he goes, something happens. He says, <clears throat> it says, now he meets a, a, he sits down by a well in a place called Midian. And there was a priest who had seven daughters <clears throat> and they came to water their dad's flock. And some shepherds came along you know, some cocky shepherds came along and they drove the girls away. Now, what's the pattern? What are you seeing in Moses here? First of all, he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. Then he sees a Hebrew beating a Hebrew. Both times he gets what? Involved. Now he's, he's at a well. These are all in a short, tight thing here. So it's trying to say something to us. He sits at this well. <clears throat> there are these girls taking care of their dad's sheep, and all of a sudden these shepherds come in. Get out of here. And starts throwing them. They, they scatter. You ever, you ever see stuff that just kind of gets you down here? He's like, I don't know, I can't stand. I'm not gonna, I don't think I can stand for that. And certainly outnumbered. We don't know how many shepherds there were. But Moses had to get involved. That, that, that can't be. Moses had this sense of justice, fairness. Hmm. Probably maybe that's why God saw fit to bring the Ten Commandments to planet Earth through him. You could see it brewing in there. That ain't right. <laughs> Moses got involved, and he, he, he came to their rescue, and he watered their flocks for them. I don't know. I don't know how many shepherds he took on. I don't know if it's like the movies, you know, where he, he just annihilated one guy, and the other two just said, well, hey, I don't really want to get involved in that. Moses was obviously something serious to contend with. The girls went home to their father, and he says, why are you home so early? And they said, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. It must have been that that's how it was. You know, I'm early. Because usually you, run, you go there, then the shepherds come, and they scare you away, and then you get a little bit more done, and then they bully you away. And it's like, why are you guys home so early? He said, well, this, this, this Egyptian came, and he just, he scattered all the shepherds. And the dad's like, well, where is he? Why, why did you leave him? Bring him here. We'll give him something to eat. They brought Moses in, and Moses thought one of the daughters was not that bad. <laughs> you know, how these stories go. She was a looker. I said, a looker. Zipporah. And they were soon married. She gave him a son named Gershom. It means I'm a foreigner. Because Moses says, I'm, a, I'm in an alien land. Again, he's known as an Egyptian. When you get to Hebrews, <clears throat> the, the writer of Hebrews comments on this story, and we, we should follow it. Hebrews 11 um, says this, um, by faith, Moses, when he, was re when he was grown, refused the privileges of the Egyptian royal house. He, he, he had a palace. Um, he chose a hard life with God's people rather than the, I like this, it was a paraphrase that I picked on purpose, an opportunistic soft life. In other words, this is a choice that all of us get to make too. He could be with the oppressors. He could stay in Egypt. He could have his nice bedroom. He could have his chauffeurs. He could have lunch made for him. You know what I did yesterday? <clears throat> Something I didn't want to do. Anybody? But it was something I really didn't want to do. You know what it was? I got out of my car, and it's 
freezing outside. And one of the tires is low, it's low. Who likes to get out, get your cold hands on all of that metal in the middle of the winter, and if there was ever a thing that I wanted to have someone else do for me, it was that. Is there a place, can you pay people? How much money, just pay. Please just, but I know I'm soft. Am I soft? Yes, I'm soft. But you don't want to do it either, so don't act so tough. Out there. I double checked with my wife. Is, is chivalry still alive? She said, yes, it is. I got out, and I put the tire in there. All of us, you know, we have, we have like simple little choices, but we, we would all, given our druthers, we'd take the softer life. I mean, I'm just not going to lie. If they had a place where you could pull in and it's a dollar and, uh, and they'll do it for you, I would have given the dollar. I wouldn't have given two, however I'm tight, but I would have given a dollar. I do not. But you, you can think about that in a lot of different levels in your life. It's just nicer when you don't have to do all these things and worry about all these things. Moses was in the palace and now he's with shepherds. They have to do everything. They have to get food on their table. They have to figure out where the food's going to come from. They have to cook it. They have to keep away bandits. They, it, it is a life of complete, harsh labor. And we should talk about that. This is the making of Moses. It kind of seems like, from the story, that he was about 40 years growing up as an Egyptian. And then it seems like from the text that he was about 40 years in the wilderness, in the desert, just as a shepherd. Which 40 years do you think molded him the most? Was it sitting there? You know, they they found ancient Egyptian toys from kids, you know. They had little dolls made out of leather, you know, and they had this one where these little ducks would go up and down, you'd pull the string, and I'm sure he had all the finest toys back then in his room. But we also know he had the finest education. And there were some smart people because they built those pyramids. So he had a pretty good education. Now listen. But then he had 40 years of being a shepherd. Now that's an education. How many know we live in a culture where this is the only education that we prize anymore? Sitting there in front of a teacher, he says X and Y turns into Z, and can you carry the one? And I forgot it all by now. But here's an education, my friends. The cold, hard realities of life. Suffering. Desert. Trying times, bandits. See, God had to get his man ready. God had to get his man ready so he could do the job. He had to grow him up. One hand, you could say he was a fully grown man. He was a fully grown man, yeah, but he wasn't mature. But yet, he didn't have hardship yet. Can I tell you something that, unfortunately, I believe just is true, even though we really don't want this to be true? You really can't be mature if you haven't had hardship. You just can't. You can try, you can educate, you can tell them, you can give them theories, and you be in the classrooms, and, you know, hey, good for you, good, do the math. But the real education is in the suffering. The real preparation, the real maturity. I mean, Moses, <laughs> we're talking about Moses. He's going to go through the ringer. He's going to try to bring all these people out of slavery, and they are not even going to appreciate him. They're going to whine about him the whole time. He's like, God, why? Why are you sending me? They don't even want me. He's like, do it anyway. Yeah, you do it anyway. These arguments between God and these people, these people, they don't like Moses, and he's stuck. But God, God, God's got him right here. He just keep going, Moses. Like, I got to get Moses ready. He's going to have to, he's going to have to leave the soft life behind. 
That's the only way this is gonna go forward. And I think that's a choice that all of us also get to make in our life. Between staying in the soft life, being willing to bear up the burden of what God's called us to do. I was thinking about, I was thinking about how soft I am when I was doing that yesterday. Like, what's wrong with you? I started telling myself, what's wrong with you? It's eight seconds. Just get out there and do it. But I was whining to myself. I know you guys never do this, but I'll just talk about me. I was whining to myself in my head. Why should I have to do this? It's so cold. My hands are cold. It's freezing out here. It's not going to work. And I thought about my dad, you know, and I had a memory. I still remember him. Just getting up at four, help him load his semi. And to get up and just pray to God that thing started. That was prayer number one. Please let it start. Please, God, let that thing start. Now, if your paycheck depends on each, each load coming in, you know, it's no fun and games, man. That thing better start. Because you can sense, you know, this needs to happen. This needs to work. It's plugged in, it's diesel, but man, it's still, it's cold. I don't remember how cold it was that day. This is why I had that memory. It was one of those minus zero days, you know, at four in the morning. I remember you, we had the old-fashioned, remember the old-fashioned snowmobile suits? It zipped all the way up, one piece. Get out there. He got it going, and we went down the road, and it just never got warm in that cab. You know, you remember the old school days? Like, you only have five minutes. I mean, you got heat everywhere. Ah, oh, that's good. This never got warm. Never. We went there, and we got to this warehouse, and started unloading this thing. I have an elevator that go in. It just keeps extending into the bed or into the box, and you just keep putting boxes on it, putting boxes on it. I had that memory yesterday when I was whining <laughs> about filling up the air in my tire. And I had a worry. I, was, I'm, I started being, I, I got worried about myself. Wait, beyond suffering now? Wait, what are you, beyond difficulty? I did, I started thinking about myself. Like, that's not good, Chris. And what I also worry about, I worry about bringing up a whole generation and all they know is this. And they never know this. We, we, got, we got like, we, we parents, we protect them, we shield them, I don't want you to, you can't have anything hard happen to you. Right? It's a parental instinct. But everybody knows, universally, everybody knows, and everybody in this room knows, that's where you learn the most. The 40 years in the wilderness. That's where you learn the most. God had to get his man ready because he had a big job for him. And here's what I'd just like to say, you know. I was supposed to read about the burning bush. We'll do it next week. We're going to read about the burning bush soon, but, but you got to get ready. And if you're not ready, what's going to get you ready? Throughout the New Testament, it gets repeated over and over and over again. But at some point, you get to choose if you're going to stay here. And it wasn't just that it was easy. That wasn't just the only point. It was easy. And it was a refusal to take the side of the, right? This was the oppressor. And Moses, as you read in these stories, when he came to the defense of the people that were oppressed over and over again, we don't know when, just listen, we don't know when Moses found out he was Hebrew. It doesn't say. It doesn't say. Remember, the mom kind of nursed him, but he grew up in an Egyptian household. I think, this is what I think. I think something triggered him when he saw that first one being beaten. He felt something in his heart. You ever felt compassion in your heart for somebody that just, I think he felt something, and I think it drew something out of him. 
I think he realized, like, that's my brother down there. He didn't know how true it was at the time. But he thought this guy was his brother, the one beating him down, and he realized, no, that's my brother down there, the one that's getting beat down. I identify with him more than I identify with him. So that's worth thinking about this week. Here's the prayer. God, I'll go to the desert. God, I'll learn my lessons because I want to be ready for what you have for me to do. We're going to say a song together and then I'll do a closing prayer.